This final session, actually, if this is your first time joining us uh, in this conference, this is actually the final session that we've had for the last, uh, I think, four years of the conference. And there's a reason why we bring these leaders back uh, again and again uh, to join us. And that's for uh, the very real uh, commitment, the very real drive, the very real reason why we gather. And that's so that every single one of us, every single community member has the opportunity to experience optimal health. Uh, in this next session, we are gonna have a table talk, uh, a round table where you're gonna get the opportunity to hear from some leaders from across the Pacific North Northwest and their experiences leading community organizations. In this idea of a new normal, we're gonna discover and talk about, even though it's been a year since we've last talked to them, what are they experiencing? And what are the conditions like now? And how can we better address? And so uh, how, do, how do we better address um, any needs or, or desires that they have as they navigate their communities? And so I would love to welcome in our panelists into today's session. Uh, joining us, we have uh, Kiantha Duncan, Dr. Luis Manriquez, Macarusa, Otestano, and I think we have everyone. Hi, y'all. How are we doing today? Good. Glad to be here. Good. Good, good, good. Uh, it's so good to see each of you uh, joining us again. We, we love you all. We're very, very grateful for your time. Um, would each of you be, be willing to introduce yourself? Let's go ahead and let's start with Mac. Thanks, Mr. Bob. Just teasing folks, oh, I don't know, there we go, that uh, I wanted to be introduced like an NBA player. I was hoping for <laughs> smoke, lights, and a cool background like yours, but I'll deal with this wooden panel behind me. <laughs> uh, Maki Rusa, Mac Protosano, he and pronouns. Um, I'm both in higher ed and the community organizing realm, so I'm the founder for the Pacific Islander Student Alliance and the Pacific Climate Warrior Chapter here in Portland, Oregon, and then I'm the director for multicultural services at Portland Community College. Thanks for being here, Mac. Uh, Kiantha? Hello, everybody. I'm Kiantha Duncan, and I am excited to be here, but I'm here today as a community member, longtime organizer over the state of Washington, not just in Eastern Washington. Uh, I was the previous president of the NAACP, which is kind of how I got involved with the work happening at um, the Office of Belonging. And so I am excited to be here with you all again today. She, her, pronoun, uh, pronouns as well. A pronoun and pronoun. She, her. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Luis Manriquez. Hey, everyone. Uh, Luis Manriquez. I'm the Director of Community Health Equity at the W.C. Wilson S. Floyd College of Medicine um, and the lead provider for the Child Street Medicine team. I uh, use he, him pronouns and um, Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this first question might be really simple, but uh, how how are you doing? <laughs> I know there's a lot going on in the world right now. I know that there's a lot happening in our communities. How how are you holding up? I will I will start there since I'm already off of mute. I am adjusting, in truth, adjusting to all of the things that are happening in our community, in our local community and in our global community. There is so much, um, I, I would say hope at the same time as sadness around the issues that we're seeing in terms of war, the things that we're seeing in terms of health concerns, again, in communities of color. And so I am worried and hopeful that that's how I'm holding up in truth. Yeah, I think, um, Kianthi, I think you captured a lot of it. I would say, you know, just for myself, um, we have a team from the last time we were on this conference. I have a team of organizers, which includes this I'm very glad to have him working with us um, at the College of Medicine that are doing, that are, that are set up to do a lot of uh, really great things uh, with the community and in partnership. And so I, you know, it's a, it, there's there's always there's always uh, good and there's always bad, but um, I think we're 
uh, we're um, in a in a in a in a growth position and able to do a lot right now. So I'm very I'm looking forward to that work. But you know, it's also an election year, and it could be an election in which we learn that um, the future is actually going backwards. Yeah. Yeah, a similar themes here. Just I think on a local level, there's a lot of excitement on a global scale, a lot of challenges. I know in the climate work and I work at the UN Climate Conference, having a oil company president as the president of COP didn't help a lot of our negotiations to protect the ocean and and the environment. And um, yeah, we still continue to push forward to the the next negotiations. I think. We are excited to uh, be in Brazil next year. And again, it's another, <laughs> it's another polluter that's gonna be uh, holding the presidency chair of um, a climate negotiation, a climate change policy and administrative um, organization. So this is really weird for us to try to push to save the world and this, these things are happening in the decision-making um, places. Yeah. Um, obviously it's been a year since we've last seen you. Um, uh, I know we've seen each other off and on since then, and we've been in community with each other, but, uh, I, I would love to hear, um, you know, are, are there any updates that you've experienced in the last year? Well, what, what is, what has life been for you, for myself? Um, last time I was here I was in a different role and now I'm here, like Luis said, uh, working alongside our health equity initiatives here at the WSU College of Medicine, which I, I want to ask you a couple of questions about that later, but um, I, yeah, we would love to give you the opportunity to hear any updates. So, like, what is what's been work like for you? I'll go again because I'm lazy and did go back on mute. <laughs> work has, has certainly been uh, very different than it was a year ago when we were here. I have spent a lot of time focusing on my um, soon to be syndicated column, advice column, Dear Kiantha, and why that is exciting is because I get to talk about everything, all the things. So things around health equity, things around just how to belong in community with people who are very different than you, how to understand um, the challenges that people face that you, you, you have no comprehension of because it's not your reality. So having the opportunity to do that uh, has been really amazing and still working with uh, many consulting clients uh, who are also working on some of the biggest initiatives in this state. Uh, I've had the, the pleasure of supporting the Gates Foundation and their Washington State Initiative team and their charters teams. So they're working and doing the big heavy lifting around education access for everyone, which to me again is right up along the lines of what we're doing here today, talking about everyone belonging in the space. So everyone belongs in the space of having access to healthcare. Everyone belongs in the space of has, having access to education. And so that kind of work has been really fueling uh, my time uh, over the last year. Also, uh, being on um, out of the position of the NAACP president, I've had the opportunity to see even that work from a different perspective and watch as the new, um, new leadership has moved in and sort of how they are choosing to move the organizations forward and learning about some of the other beautiful things that are happening in terms of health in the community. So I, I know that there is stuff happening around having um, a, a place of belonging for African Americans who are, you know, looking for a specific health care. And then there is work happening in the Latina community for their own health care system. Like all of that is just really beautiful and it's wonderful to see from the outside looking in too. Thanks, Kyanta. Luis? Yeah, I and mean, I think that um, you know, in terms of in terms of updates, uh so you know, we're continuing to build our, our, our work that we're doing in the community. We started a um, clinic organizing program in Everett, actually, with the internal medicine residency, with WSU's new internal medicine residency. And so that, you know, that in healthcare, you know, we talk about community and we're usually talking about the communities that are not in, in, in medicine. But medicine has its own community, has its own culture. Um, and in a lot of ways, uh, it's a it's a fairly toxic one, and so um, being able to uh, be part of the turning of that 
um, and doing, you know, there's lots of people that, that see that and are trying to bring up the, the best in us in healthcare. And I think, uh, you know, this program at Everett is, is one way of doing that is one way of kind of orienting around community need instead of sort of um, setting things up and expecting people to come to us. Uh, so that's something that um, I'm excited about. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, uh, so in Spokane, um, we have a, a new mayor and that new mayor, um, you know, is, is looking out and is interested in what we have to say and what we're trying to do. I, there will always be some negotiation. There'll always be some work on where we end up, but that's a huge difference from, uh, you know, the sort of locked door uh, that, that anyway that I experienced experience in the previous administration. So um, I think that's, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely, Mac. I don't know, like the local movement stuff, I, the orgs that I'm affiliated with have grown exponentially. And so um, pre-pandemic and into the heart of the pandemic of uh, years, I was a uh, president for the Samoa Pacific Development Corporation and, uh, you know, when we found folks to come in and really uplift the work and take it on, uh, we went from being, you know, a group that worked with less than $100,000 a year to being a multi-million dollar organization, hiring community health workers, mental health providers, and uh, education resource uh, specialists to multiple counties in the state for the Samoan community. And that's been... Um, it's very exciting. It's also very scary because it's like, all right, we got this money. How do we keep it up and keep these folks employed? Um, the realities of, of growing from really grassroots to now being, you know, part of a, a solution in the state. And then on the other end, it's like, I was just telling uh, Kianta this, that I, I, I have a seven-year-old now, I mean, seven-month-year-old son. And so I'm having to say no to things. Uh, no, I can't. I can't do this. No, I can. And then one of the interesting things, I'll just be very transparent and vulnerable. Um, I thought modeling what it would mean to step down from work would be uh, praised like the yes. So in some ways, a lot of people are like, hey, by you taking this break, I had given myself permission to take a break that I need. And this is good. And then on the other end, surprisingly, um, the other end, surprisingly, uh been like you left us and i'm just like oh okay so this is the other end of organizing too that we do hold a lot of weight and uh, the preparation needs to be there but also uh we're not all walking the talk in terms of uh how we support our communities and the work to sustain ourselves so it's a it's just a new thing we haven't been organizing as a community collective islander community and so a lot of these are just knowing that they're they're growing pains and that we'll we'll find our way through. But um yeah, organizing is interesting. We went from having no money and everyone wanted to be a part of it and getting along to having a lot of money and not knowing how to, to work in community as much anymore. It's it's a real challenge. Mac, I think that's amazing uh what what you just said. And I think it is it transcends community. It transcends to all BIPOC communities. And so I would love uh, for us to at some point figure out how we can even maybe through through our connections with uh, the Office of Belonging, figure out what do we provide in terms of supports for leaders of communities of color who are doing this work and as they need to, you know, ebb and flow out in and out of the work, what do we do and how do we build community and structure in a way that upholds leaders as they take their, their break and how the work continues to move without all of the momentum stopping and then have to start back over every time. So that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think it kind of also, Kiant, I think your your curiosity is also kind of, it, it, I'm with right with you. I, I wanted to hear more, Mac, like, what are those things? Like, what, what would be the ideal, like, Similarly, I, I left an organization as well. And if I felt the same sort of like, oh yeah, this is, this is very, it, it was a void that people, you know, that we experienced, but also like the work has to keep going and how do you help folks in that space? So yeah, I just love to hear more. Yeah. So I think in my, like in the group site, like I was the people that paid me 
we were good. And I think sometimes we undersell the importance or impact we have on other organizations, right? And so my work is not isolated and all the intersections of organizations that we work with, different communities and focuses, they were all impacted. And I kind of downplayed what my role was in community. And so when I left, I thought I did good. Okay, my organization's straight. We made the transition, we got people prepped, but we didn't prep everyone on the outside. And that takes a lot of work. And it's not, it, that's a lot of weight for a small organization to take on. Big institutions have to do it too. Like Oregon has something called Oregon pay leave. And I'm about to go on a 12 week, you know, parental leave, but this is our first year doing it. You would think uh, a community college institution, they would be ready and prepped for when leaders need to take their leave. And we're scrambling right now. So it, it, I think the intentionality to support folks, it can't just be in the relationship realm, it has to be in the, in the system as well. So uh, I think just knowing the, the, the breadth of our impacts will help um, future folks who need to take the breaks understand you know, what's needed. And then the other part is like we need, uh, it's also a systemic thing that we're battling because these are new practices that are pushing against um, old practices that have held us down from being good to ourselves, good to our community. And I don't take any any of the criticism that folks might have given me. I, I see it as a more systemic problem. Uh, this is more about we're all learning and once we learn, we'll laugh about this later. But they still come to my barbecues. They might be mad, but they're still coming to eat at my house, right? Eat my food, it can't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that uh, that is too real. This year, that has definitely been a new normal that I have not been used to. Of like, oh, you want to? We're not gonna get into that. We're not gonna get into that. <laughs> so, um, it it sounds like, um, uh, like uh, Louise, what you were saying about a new mayor and the role politics has played in opening up opportunity. Also, we have at the same time, politics that are closing opportunity for you, Mac. Keonta, you're seeing shifting happening because of politics and because of the politics at play. This conference is about understanding what a new normal is. And we recognize that a new normal um, is, this new normal is wrought with challenges, right? It's it's wrought with, um, uh, the impact of racism, the impact of discrimination. I mean, that's always at play, but we're seeing it, um, or I should say like, it's it's like the thing everybody's talking about in the room now. And um, maybe that wasn't, um, maybe it wasn't as so much in the forefront, but it feels like every single person, every single organization is having to address um, some sort of systemic issue, some sort of systemic oppression whether it be because of COVID or because of civil unrest or world war, whatever it could be. And then on top of that, it sounds like there's these outside social factors that are also shifting the work. Um, as we consider what a new normal could be like, like, what do you think about what, what comes to mind or, or what for you is the new normal? In all honesty, one of the things that I love about this conference and I love about this panel of folks, because we have been doing it for several years, is that we just really have really authentic conversation, you know, in this space. And so one of the things that I am noticing and have noticed really since the pandemic is that you are right, um, since the pandemic and since the racial uh, reckoning, as people call it, of, of George Floyd's murder and, and how that kind of tipped uh, the iceberg over. Many people, as you mentioned, are having these conversations. Almost all organizations, almost all companies, corporations are having the conversation. However, to me, and, and this has been my experience, the conversations are still at that performative level. It's not necessarily at a transformative level. And so it doesn't really mean a lot if we're just talking about it, but it's small talk. How do we actually have the conversations that will transform these systems that we are still all being impacted by? That's, that's to me, uh, what I'd like to see and the new normal that we've seen thus far in the most recent uh, history, little bit of history, it's still performative. So we haven't even really 
got there yet. We're, we're still we're still in the acting phase. It's getting to know each other, you know, it's talking small talk, uh, you know, those kinds of things. But we have to get beyond that because the thing that is going to be so important is that if we want to see true belonging in healthcare, if we want to see true belonging in education, true belonging in community in terms of uh, a decrease in racism and white supremacy culture, we got to go deeper. We have to go deeper. And I will tell, I will be the first one to say, using the analogy of swimming, deeper is scary. Deeper is scary because you don't feel your feet up under you. You don't feel those, you know, side rails to help you in those tough moments. But if we don't commit to doing it, then we're just still spending a lot of time, you know, spending time. This is the moment where we need the snap, a snap. Uh, <laughs> um, Luis, I'm, I'm curious, um, you, you're one of the folks, so here in Spokane recently, we had, um, we experienced a little bit of a freeze, um, and, and it really displaced a lot of folks. Um, and it, it shifted a lot of the uh, work really quickly here in Spokane to, to, to see houseless folks, you know, um, uh, move into safety, right? Move into shelter. There was a lot of, of positive movement. There was also a lot of criticism, probably more than what we've seen before in the work that you're doing. You know, what, what is the new normal for you? Um, I mean, I think, uh, I guess maybe the new normal is just that the, the sides are getting sharper, you know, like, um, I, I think all the problems remain, positive motion remains, people with good intentions remain, but like the level of uh, the extremity may be a response. Um, and so I'm talking about, you know, taking care of people that are living on the streets. Like, I, I think, you know, I guess I see a lot more like people have a, openly negative emotional response to people on the street where they used to be like, I just don't want to see that or, you know, try to try to brush it under the table. Now it, now it seems like people have, feel like they have some license to aggression um, around that. Uh, and so, you know, at the same time, like this winter, cause winter happens every year, right? But every year it's an emergency. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of churches step up to start warming shelters. We had a lot of volunteers for the expansion of warming shelters when it was negative five degrees outside. So, you know, a lot of people are also stepping up to embrace, uh, embrace and help. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't think that it's all bad, but I do feel like polarization, like just being extremely polarized is the, is the, is the new normal for, for a lot of that work. Um, and, and like I said, because it's polarized, right? So like I have 10 year old twins and, you know, I think they watched a, uh, they were watching like a, a teen movie from like when I was a kid and it was like very hard to explain to them the level of like uh, clickiness and judging and like just open, you know, uh, shaming and hating on other people that was like what we were being fed in mainstream as mainstream media and then I look at like what it looks like right now you know what the kids are getting shown and it is a lot better um, and so in their heads uh, you know they just don't understand they're like what's what's that like why that um, and so I think that's you know that's like hugely positive uh, so, mm. thanks, Luis. Mac, what are you experiencing? Yeah, there's a lot of similar things. I think both Luis and Kianta spoke a lot on my truth. So, I think I'll double down on the performative part. Um, in a lot of our attempts to train young folks to get or to learn to organize, a lot of it's and not just young folks. It's like new organizers. Um, People are jumping straight to the mic. They want to be at the head, but nobody wants to wash the dishes. 
Nobody wants to drive the vans. Nobody wants to pick up the trash. And I, and we're trying to tell them like at the foundation of our grassroots movement, this is this is where it's at. Somebody has to do the dirty work and you have to know how to do that if you want to connect with people, you want to connect on a very human level. And we just can't all be on the mic saying all the, the words people think they need to hear. And this is becoming a problem that folks go and give a really powerful speech in the public forum and call themselves organizers. But when we need them to organize people, they're organizing themselves. They're building their own personal profiles. And I'm just seeing this more and more. They're showing up to our college campuses to give talks. And I'm, you know, I'm very critical, of like, but what, what's your organizing? What is your framework? Who are the people you're organizing? And a lot of the time it's, they can't answer it other than like, I'm with these folks, these folks, these folks. And I'm like, I know those people. I haven't seen you on the streets. Haven't you seen you at the community meetings? Um, I don't know, organizing, I think in the new normals, we're having to fight for what that looks like. And it can evolve. It definitely can evolve. Um, you know, I sound like an hit a lot when I'm talking about this with my students, but I, I just believe in it. We have to, we have to be people grounded first before um, we get up and be able to speak, speak on something. So I think that that's just something I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of. Can I add to, to what yes. Max said? Mac, yes. listen, you are on fire tonight, Mac. You are on fire. <laughs> Somebody send him some water because he is hot. Uh, the, the, the difference in what we're seeing in organizing, I do want to speak to that because I think you are so spot on. You know, I you're an old head, Mac. I'm an even older head than you. So I can tell you that my my uh, community activism and organ and organizing and my history, my journey started with changing the liners at, at in the garbage cans, right? You don't just get to be the president. You don't just get to be the lead person. You don't just get the mic. But in today's day, you do. It does work like that. It almost to me has started to feel like the loudest voices are the people who are at the front um, of, of the room. That's never been the best idea. That's never been the best idea who speaks the loudest, right? So you have uh, different leaders who have different strength sets. And what I'm noticing in this new normal is that it's not even really about strength. It's about, it's about volume volume. It, is your voice the loudest? Can you be in the most places? Volume. And that is not necessarily um, the best model for depth of work, right? So real organizing requires real relationships and a real depth of connection to, uh, to community, to individuals, to organizations, to people. It is not doing things that furthers that polarized model that, that Dr. Louise was talking about. That is enough of that. Absolutely. When what you're saying, Kianta, also makes me think about a lot of the surveys that, that and a lot of the studies that people are doing now on um, organizations that thrived with in the in the early 80s and 90s, and and also they were looking at churches and, and what they're finding now is even people who are going to faith communities that's declining. The number of folks who are wanting to attend and participate in in organizations those are those are declining. Membership in 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 organizations is declining and. And I think it's, it's um, yeah, I think one of the things that we don't, one of the things that I'm realizing that we, that we lack in our trainings or like one of the pieces we don't talk enough about is authenticity mm -hmm. and how important authenticity is to this work because authenticity allows me to recognize when I'm wrong, when I've done something wrong. And it gives me the opportunity to go check in with somebody like Mac or with you, Keontha or with Luis and say, hey, I messed up in this space or I didn't do this right. Can you come alongside me and help me so that way I can learn and 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 how 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 can I how can I fix what I've done wrong, you know, or how can I fix um or, or even admit when I need to 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 do something better? Like I think, you know, with a lot of our young folks, we miss that one part. Um and, and I think that's you know, I, I think about that a lot. Um so Kianta, going into this idea about going deeper. Um, for somebody who might be new, for somebody who is young, Mac, for for a new organizer, for a new Dr. Luis, what 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 does that look like? Um, how do we go deeper? What are the questions we need to be asking? And then also, let me also say this really fast too before we answer that. Um, if you have uh, questions, uh, friends who are attending, 
I would love to start populating those now. My eyes aren't what they used to be. So I need the time to get, I need the time to like get them enlarged to put on the screen. <laughs> so if you have questions, please drop those into the chat. Um, but uh, going back to our conversation, you know, what, what is the going deeper? What are the questions we need to be asking? And if they're, you know, or what are the questions we're not asking that, that, that we're missing? Well, I would say there's a few. So the first question is, um, and this is for any, any uh, leader, organizer, person that is moving into this work, uh, never, you can never, never forget that someone, many someones have done it before you many someones. And so while there are moments and pieces of whatever was done before you that you can certainly make better, that you can certainly add something additional to, that's the, that's growth. That's how it happens, right? There are those pieces. But what you do not do is throw away the baby with the bathwater, as they used to say. You, you don't get to do that. You, you know, you're not, because nothing is new under the sun. Nothing, nothing is new under the sun. So everything that we're experiencing and dealing with now, we, we were dealing with and experiencing before. Now we might just have more access to different resources to solutions, different paths to solutions that we didn't have before. So coming in as a leader and saying, I'm still, I'm willing to learn, I'm still a student. I'm, I'm a leader and a student at the same time. You don't get to be Dr. Enrique before you are student Enrique unless they did that different. You don't get to be Dr. Louise until you are student Louise first. You don't get to be Mac until you are young Mac. You don't get to be Kiantha until you're young Kiantha first. And so coming into these spaces in which the door is wide open, there's room for everyone in the space. There really is. There is, there is no limit to the number of organizers we can have. There's no limit to the number of leaders that we can have. There's enough for everyone. However, you move into that space knowing that you're you're um you're joining something that already exists. You're joining something that already exists. Yeah. So that's you know kind of what comes to mind for me. The other thing is all, always keeping in mind that there is no leader that knows everything. Otherwise, the problem would have been solved. <laughs> So there's no one that has all the answers. We learn together. We're in this together. Again, taking the, the word belonging and really picking that thing apart, belonging on every level, including leadership, including community advocacy. Like where is the belonging in all of it? So when I when I hear anything, when someone invites me to something and belonging is a part of the, the, the subject line, I'm in because I think it, it applies to every area, every corner, every crevice of our being and our, and our existence. So I'd like to see just more people understanding that concept and being willing to uh, join hands and join space with others who may think differently. Louise, I'm, I'm just taking in a lot of what people have been saying because I think it, I mean, it really is a, a great, honest conversation. Um, one way I think of putting it in terms of like, like I think as an organizer, the question that should always be in your head is um, how are people taking ownership of this thing, whatever it is, right? So uh, when people, because because to me, what that means is that when people have ownership over something, they take care of it, they're responsible for it, they will show up to lead, they're not waiting to be told that because it's theirs and they, you know, they're in. Um, and, and I think some of the, some of the things that, that have been mentioned, you know, I think it's, it's like people want to be in control. And control is different. Control is telling other people what you want to see happen. And, and that's not what we're after. But, you know, when you have ownership over something, you know, you're, you're taking the response, like you're the bottom line on it. Like this is mine and it's ours together. You know, that can be a shared ownership, but you know, that, that sort of, that, that conveys to me a deeper conviction. And so when the, when the students or the community partners or whomever are, are taking initiative on all the little pieces, that's because they've got ownership. You know, when they show up at the meeting to to score points or to say the thing, 
you know, that's, that's about, that's about control or that's just about like, you know, their own, where they're at, you know, it's, it's, that's about their own personal engagement. But when it, for it to be collective, it got it, it, it gets to that deeper point. And so, I mean, that's, that's the question that's always going through my head is like, what is it going to take for people to have ownership here? Cause that's my job. And that's the other part of it, I guess, is, um, you know, I already, I already decided that this was a thing that I wanted to see happen. And so what's on me to do, right? Like, like I'm the one that uh, thinks that this can be better in this way and that I can't do it myself. So it's on me to make those, make that, make that into a we, right? So. Mm. You know, I'll, I think there's a few things that come to mind around that. And a lot of that's like around organizational capacity. Uh, there's so much to do, so much little to give. And I think sometimes the urgency kicks in to where we feel like we have to act now. And so the pressure to move faster um, as an organization uh, negates the, the, the ability to, to move deeper. I think it was like, oh, forgetting which organizer it was, I think it's Adrian Marie Brown. It's like, it, it's better to focus on the things you can have big differences on and rather than doing a lot of things and just being, you know, putting a little bit into it. And so I, when I think about that, I think about organizational structure and why so many people move towards grabbing the mic. Then the other words, I, I, I think it's also in our structure. And so everyone, there's a lot of pressure for folks and, and their self-worth is based around moving up rather than moving in. And compensation for folks for moving up is where you, you feel, you know, that you're validated. And but if, if the work is really about what's happening in inside of the organization at the core of, of its soul, um, then that should be the goal, I think, in terms of like where we're focusing uh, recognition and a lot of that time when I speak of recognition, I'm thinking of compensation. And so can we think about those who are on the ground and what they're doing in community and give them something? And are we in the position then? Because there's also a lot of pressure as an executive director that you know you want them to feel safe for decisions that they have to make that could affect the entire organization. But um, there's just a lot of, you know, that the act of wanting to be recognized is always about getting that top spot. And I, I'm always trying to reframe, reframe that like the decision to move in rather than putting ourselves over others. Yeah. Uh, can I, uh, I was reminded of something too. I had the really probably what is, will always be one of the biggest honors of my life uh, in being the commencement uh, speaker for the College of Medicine a few years ago. And I remember as I was preparing for that moment, I really wanted to talk about things that made a difference in the lives of those health practitioners who were graduating. And something that was really important to me uh, then, and it still apply, it applies even to organizing and the, the shift that we're seeing in, in how organizers show up is that we, we were asking, I was asking, I was personally asking, the health practitioners who were graduating to basically go into their field without ego, right? Y yes, you are extremely intelligent. Of course you are. You, I mean, you've gone through medical school. Like you, you, you're the top of the top. But in that position, in that power that you hold, how do you still connect with the families who you are serving? How do you connect with communities who are unlike those you've moved in before? And that can only happen when you take one humility as a first approach to your work. You have to take humility as a first approach. And then also you have to remove your ego. Uh, although you're the smartest dude in the room at the time that you walk into that room with that white jacket on, right? So the same thing goes for organizing. How do you do organizing? How do you do activism with removing your ego as being the first thing that shows up in the space? So like Mac was saying, the person you know who's on the mic is the loudest voice, but that can sometimes be coupled with ego. Ego, you know, I remember one of the things that for me, um, as I was considering even taking on the presidency of the NWCP, 
I had a conversation with the executive committee at the time. And I said, listen, if y'all want somebody that's going to be the loudest, it's not me. It's not me. I'm not going to do it. I don't ever want the bullhorn. I don't want, I don't even move that way. And so that is a different style of activism because we have gotten accustomed to activism needing to be the loudest, you know, the most aggressive. And that is not, I mean, it's always been done that way, but we can clearly look back and say, that's not always effective. So how do we like continue as a community at large to say the best thing for all involved is that we, we, we leave our ego, we check it at the door. If we're in fact coming into the room in whatever room that be, be it that health, health, um, health and wellness or education or, you know, politics, whatever it is, how do we leave that at the door so that we can do what's best for everyone in the room and ego will get in the way of that every time. Oh, y'all, we would pay thousands of dollars for this course and you're getting it today for free. <laughs> um, Mac is the professor. Mac is the main professor. <laughs> um, there's a, a, a question uh, similar, kind of in the thread um, of, of what you're talking about, kind of what we're talking about. It, it's a little, uh, I want to make sure that I frame it right. So this is sent to us in the chat. And the question is, do you think that some people have lost respect for expertise, experience, and bona fides. Um, the person writes, I do not think that all opinions are equal, even though everyone's opinion has value. Um, can we belong in spaces as someone with expertise without other people thinking that that means that they are less valued? Governor, yeah. that's you, Mac, and you, you, uh, Dr. Louise, you are the governors. I'm just here as an assistant. Y'all take this. <laughs> well, I, I'll just say, as someone with a lot of uh, um, positional clout, you know, with the white coat, um, that, uh, you know, that isn't always, um, it isn't always valid. Right, the uh, the deference given to people in authority, and therefore it's not always wrong to challenge it. Um, I do, you know, so that's that's true, right? Like just because I know a lot about uh, how to treat your pneumonia doesn't mean I know anything about it. What it's like to walk in your shoes. Um, so on that hand I think like a um a sort of stripping away of you know expertise that's given without without uh without background I guess or with this not earned um it, it's a good thing um but I also think that like there are some things in which like you should just listen to what I have to say because I actually there's a reason why you sent why there are doctors because the basic assumption is everyone can't understand uh medicine because they got other things to do <laughs> I want someone who's like I put a lot of time into this so so as far as that goes, like there is a role for expertise, but I guess really what it is, is it's usually more narrow. And so I think like just being clear on when we should be listening and when it's actually uh, a real conversation, right? Like the way you, the way to put it simply is that like expertise should be on tap and not on top. So I'm not in charge just because I have an MD, but if you have a question about like, you know, what do I do about my kids cough like I definitely have something to offer you there but then if we have a question around like housing in this community you shouldn't be listening to me just because I walked up with a white coat you should be listening to me because it's something we've been working on for years you know that's something that gets earned anybody else want to anyone else have thoughts I thought that was really good. Uh, I, I love the analogy of like on tap, not on top. I, I think something we'll always say is like leadership's everybody's business. Like everyone in the room has something to offer. It doesn't mean that what you have to say has to be the solution. Um, folks can make a collective decision 
in and then an expert in the room um, can you know take whatever information that's there in the collective in, in terms of like the loss of respect for expertise i i just think sometimes like in today's world things are saturated so we have a lot of pop-up experts that are showing up that like i think that's where community comes in where there's a collective understanding of who it is we can go to uh, to seek our information and build like trusting words that come from folks that we know but um you know it's just hard when the world's gotten so much smaller or, or even bigger in some cases that you're getting your information from random people who put letters and and then they might be not who they say they are so um that's on a more bigger scale i think in the organizing realm there's a lot of checks and balances to make sure you know who are the folks that are we're bringing into space that we're protecting um you know the our goals that we're collectively trying to do as a community but yeah uh, i think louis said a lot of what i was trying to say sure 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 um, thanks, y'all. And thank you to the person who asked that question. I think, yeah, the conversation on ego. I wanted to throw in one more oh, yeah. thing on that question, though. Just like in the chat, they talked about like how Dr. Fauci was treated. And and this is the thing is that there's two things on that. One is that, you know, how Dr. Fauci was treated by the media, by people who had a vested interest in creating conflict uh, is one thing. And then the so, you know, uh, some of that some of that treatment was disingenuous because it was about like creating conflict. Um, and, and, and the other thing is it's white supremacy culture that teaches white men that they are a king unto themselves and therefore they know everything. And so, you know, there's, I think there's a legitimate reason why a lot of the like, I don't need to listen to any expert, you know, I know everything, I can know everything is tied to like a very, uh, uh, a very um, reactive, reactive politics, you know, like that's very much tied to, to that control because it's like, no one can challenge me. And therefore your expertise doesn't matter because, you know, I'm a king unto myself. And so, you know, that, that's, uh, that's a root of that, that maybe we don't, usually talk about but i think that you know they they do go together absolutely um i think the i mean the, the first example for me that comes to mind is like politics right and the folks that we elect into office we elect them most of the time into office because they sound good they talk good they know how to meet with folks they shake all the hands in the room that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the community's interest at mind or that they are going to actually provide answers or responses that actually benefit each of us. And so totally, totally, totally. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Go ahead, count up. Go right ahead. Yeah, let me add this before we switch, because I think we are uh, talking in this moment more specifically about, you know, those who are in positions of power in healthcare. But, you know, I want to make sure that we we don't leave off community activism and that piece, because that's, you know, Mac and I care a lot about that. And I know Dr. Manriquez does as well. But I will tell you this, that that whole theory of being a king, uh, you said it, I wrote it down because it was so good, a king unto themselves, that translates over into activism as well. And that translates into the world of folks who are saying that they are doing work to to better community, but they are a king unto themselves as well. I see it every day. I'm on on social media sometimes. I see it every day. (laughs) Well, Count that you're like every every session you're like just ready for the next question. You like say the right thing to get us ready into the next like section. Uh, I'm thinking about being a king unto themselves. You know, at medical schools, <laughs> um, we know the history, right? We talk about it all the time. We 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 think about how do we correct, how do we course correct, what do we need to do to make sure that we are doing what we say we're going to do and that we're remaining present and and we're keeping true to our word. Um, last year, I told you um, that we would be streaming this conference from the center of the people. That was one of the big unveiling pieces and um, we we're in the center for the people. And so uh, this 
for for us, you know, I I I don't we don't want to lie, right? We want to make sure that we are we're telling the truth and that we are holding as much space for um realities to be reflected back to us. Um and this space for us truly um, is meant to be a hub for the community. It's meant to be a space um, where people can access it and use it. And hopefully at some point we'll be able to offer services to folks. And this truly will be a place where, where people who uh, might need, uh, who might have more questions or might, who, not, who may not feel like they belong in a doctor's office or may not feel like they uh, are, are welcome in certain spaces that this could operate as that. Um, that's That was one of our commitments to you last year. Um, that was one of the things we've been talking about for a while. And uh, so we want to, I want to ask this question again. I've asked it a couple of times to you already, but um, how are we doing? What, what, what advice can you give us? And if you haven't heard anything, what, what can we do to better that? Oh, I want to start on that one too. Here's what I think is lovely. The people and organizations who are constantly like you all saying, what can we do better? To be like, what, are we leaving anything out? Are we forgetting anyone? Are we, are we keeping true to our word? Those are usually not the organizations that need to be changing what they're doing. You guys are usually <laughs> on the right path already. It's the ones who are making assumptions that they're doing everything right, who never ask, what can we do differently? How are we doing? What can we do better? Those are the organizations that I'm more so concerned about. I think that you all have all of the right people attached to the work. So you have those checks and balances that Max spoke about earlier. You have that. You have people who are socially, morally conscious doing the work. And so to me, you, I just, and it's, it's not because you keep asking me to come back. That is not why I'm saying this, because I would tell you and be like, I'm not coming back next year, y'all. Uh, but I really do think that you all are doing such a wonderful job and at the same time, not only are you keeping to your, your values and to the, the core reasons that the Office of Belonging was even created, the center was created, you're keeping so close to that, that you are able to measure and the community is able to measure, physically measure your work. So you guys are doing a really good job. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on here. I'm really saying it because you are living it, you're breathing it, everything that you're connected to is also living and breathing it as well. So I think I think you guys are doing a wonderful job. I'll go this time so you, you <laughs> so at go last if I um <clears throat> yeah I I kind of checked out for the year. So when my son was born, I didn't read my emails. I didn't check up with David and see how things are going. Um, and I guess my my question, a lot of those things are just like, I remember what I said when this question was asked and it's like, what is our engagement with community? What of our, I see the question in the chat too, and we we're talking about a lot of like uh, the re-indigenizing or decolonizing of space. Um, and then the question around what do people get when, how are they sustained when they come into places? Uh, I think a lot of times we, we see things are become transactional and especially in the education institution of, uh, you know, the thing we give are degrees, but it, we're not feeding the thing that's sustaining folks. I always use food as a metaphor. I, I talked about barbecue like five times today, but I mean, a lot of times for a lot of communities of color, it's food that is our gathering space, but it's around, Food is also a, a metaphor for our resources that come together um, to bring forth those conversations that need to be happening. And so whatever is happening, I just hope that like it has been a continual uh, process to be a place to sustain community, to sustain and nourish uh, the movements and to uh, get into people's spaces so they can see themselves in the institution and at the building that we're at. And if I could just say, I'm, I'm so grateful that you were able to check out for the year and that you're able to focus on your child and, and that was an experience that you've been able to hopefully positive and hopefully you know you got some rest in there um but yeah thank you so much back and thank you Kianta. 
Um, I want to uh, switch to a couple of questions that we have here in the chat. Um, uh, so we have one that's around, given the digital age we are in, where individualism, isolation, what quote unquote struggle Olympics has potentially caused detachment and a separation amongst community building. How do we get back to decolonizing our perspective on community to bring people together for authentic spaces of belonging? So what, what do we need to do to get back? I wish I had an answer for that. And in truth, I don't. I don't because I have the same question myself. What how do we get how do we get I don't even know if it's back. How do we how do we get to a version of that? How do we get to a version of that? Because everything is new and some things we can't go back to. And so how do we get to a, a, a new iteration of that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So for whoever asked that question, you asked it for me as well. Um, I think, so, you know, I work a lot, I'm really busy, and when I'm, when I'm busy, it's like some of the, some of the flexibility strips away, like it becomes, some of the openness strips away, like it becomes getting stuff done instead of like taking the time to be with people the way that you should be with them every moment. Um, and and that also is like you know like showing up to support community events like you know i work a lot i have kids at home so i can't be out all the time um and and so anyway so what i think that what that says to me is that like how do you how do you find the the time to make like intentionally to make space, right? Like, like I intentionally go home and watch television with my wife, right? But like, then you just kind of hope that community happens, you know? And so it's like, how are you intentionally doing that thing? And that, you know, like, like Mac, I love the analogies around food, but like that happens, right? Like someone, you know, when people get together and they make tamales together, like somebody made that happen, right? And it, like, it might be grandma and you always take grandma you just assume she's always going to be there and she's always going to be structuring reality that way. But like, you know, somebody made that happen and the next generation has to fill that role too. Um, and so, I don't know, it's just, it's just uh, in, in a sense, it's like, what's the thing that you could do that would satisfy yourself and, and be community building? And then, then like, maybe that's the thing to do instead of the like, the isolating thing, which is, you know, I don't know what TikTok or TV or Facebook or what have you. Hmm. It, it may be also advantageous, uh, Esteban, for us to value conveners, because like Dr. Luis said, sometimes you don't have the space for it. You don't, you know, he, he, and I'm going to use you as an example, example, Dr. Luis. You have twin kids, you have a wife, you have a family and you have a busy, busy practice and work. And so if you can't be in all of the spaces, then we got to start valuing some folks who can be in those spaces in our stead. And so that is not always, you know, there's not always um, uh, compensation and, and uh, a way to make that happen, but maybe that's something we look at and, and start to say, hmm, if we can't spread ourselves any thinner, how do we get the professionals in, the people who can do that work? How do we bring them in to do that work and and value, you know, the, what they bring to the table in in this in the spaces that we can't be at the table? Yeah. One of the practices that I appreciate here at the College of Medicine that we do with the students at the very beginning of the year is we do um, uh, recasting or we do um, like an exercise around the acculturation of medicine. And we come into the space and one of the first things that we have the students repeat back to us is I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be number one. 
I don't have to know all the answers. I don't have to come into this space as the expert. And we make them repeat these statements back to us so that way they hear that they don't have to do things like the way other medical schools expect them to be. They don't have to work to compete. And, and I think it helps re-script, re rethink about what their trajectory is going to be like because it allows them to show up in full in fullness, full authentic self. And so I, I, it, it's a small practice. It may not, you know, some of them probably go, oh yeah, whatever. But, but in reality, what we're saying is that, that we're rejecting, right, the, the notion, uh, like what Dr. Mendicus was talking about earlier, the, the man in the white coat who knows everything, who becomes the, author, the authoritative figure in the room the second they walk in, that can be, we can put that distance, we can put that behind us, we can say that that, you know, we can dismantle that and say, you know, we as individuals first have power, have story, and that's what's coming into the space them as students, them as learners, them with their experience and the experiences that we all have, we get the opportunity to build that together. So I don't know, I just think also saying it sometimes is helpful, you know, laying, you know, calling out what needs to be called out, giving folks the opportunity to speak that out and then doing our best to shift the environment too can be helpful. Uh, Mac, any thoughts? I think disconnecting when opportunities present itself to do that, that's also just something that takes time and resources that we can't do. And so, you know, any, I'll give an example, like we're able to get students out to the Pacific, especially those in the diaspora who've never been home um, or to any of the islands. And it's sort of like a trip that like, they're like, all right, we're in a place with uh, no electricity uh, where people are on their devices all the time. And it's a, it's just, mm -hmm. It's an amazing experience to witness that they have to relearn some of their human behaviors in terms of how they're interacting with folks. I mean, you do that in the forest, you can do that somewhere else, but like, I think um, some of those things is like just pulling away from um, the digital, if we're looking for ways to, per the question, uh, get back to some uh, community perspectives, I think those retreats are also important for teams to build on to, to really pull themselves away and figure out who they are uh, at the very foundational basis of their, their humanity. Um, you know, I think that's really true. Uh, I was just thinking about, you know, you had me thinking about like, like Gaviotas, right? This Palo Lugare creating this eco city in, in, uh, in the savannas. Um, and, a lot of the people uh, that were there and helped make it happen, like on reflection, it was because like they were there and they had nothing else to do. So like, let's, <laughs> let's build this community here, right? H. Jack Geiger and John Hatch and the first community health centers, like, you know, talking to them in reflection, they're like, well, you know, we had, we had these, um, these medical professionals and young experts here and uh, they didn't have anything else to do. And so they, would teach classes at night. They would like get involved because you know you're, you're with some with some open space. You know you fill that up, but you got to open up some of that space. And and the way society is structured now is all of these things are jumping into any space that you've got in your brain. So you kind of have to wall some of that off so that you have space for the things you want, not just the things that that hook you. Mm, absolutely. Okay, we're, we're at the end of our time and I want to respect your time. And so I've got two more questions for you. Um, this first one I think is such a poignant question in this entire conversation um, because we talk about the work that we do within ourselves, showing up authentically into these spaces, right? We, we want to focus the belonging, but what do we do? Um, you know, this is someone who's a young professional asking this question, who's working within health, health equity, what are best practices to develop powerful partnerships with individuals reluct reluctant to accept structural racism and social determinants of health? And their second question is, is it, is it just best to focus on people and organizations that recognize that they exist? Well, I, I will tell you, I feel like I can, can lend something to this question uh, as you know, having served the uh, NAACP and social justice organization. It's easy. It's easy to 
say, you know what, we're not going to focus on the people who don't understand this. Let's just focus on those that do. That's certainly easier to say. However, what is also real is that typically the people who do not understand it are those who are in more positions of power. So if you dismiss them and say, I'm not spending any time trying to get you to understand racism and you know all, all of these things, I'm just gonna move over here to the group of folks that do. We are missing out on a key group of individuals by which without them changing, the systems won't likely change. So my um, personal approach has always been to, you know, practice even more um, patience, even more kindness, even more understanding. I push myself to the limits when it comes to that, because that is where the true work has to also happen. It's not an either or. It's not a we can just dismiss that population of people and then move towards the ones that do understand. We can't do that. We, we still have to be inclusive and we have to understand belonging because they belong too. And no matter what, they will be a part of our human family. And at no point is it okay for anyone to dismiss any part of our, our, our human family. So it's, it's, it's us, you know, in that moment, we still have to continue to grow, continue to expand, continue to challenge ourselves to not leave that group behind, but to figure out ways in which we can build relationship with them so that they can hear us when we say there is another reality that you may not see or may not believe at this moment. But if you trust me as a human, if I've developed relationship with you as a human, then you can hear me when I say that. If I don't build a relationship, you're not going to hear anything I'm saying. And then, you know, that is not going to be a fruitful partnership. But we, I'm putting the onus on us as those who are working in the field of social justice, who are working in anti-racism work and the work of belonging. We still have to keep pushing ourselves a little bit more and expanding a little bit more every day. We're not off the hook, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. No, not at all. I'll jump in and it, I have a very, my experiences are very similar, but I think one of the growing trends I see in organizations I work with is that someone in leadership will say, we're not messing with those people, but never bother to ask who has the capacity on the team to take up this work. And, you know, my experience has been because I, I started higher ed doing men's work and specifically with men of color. And it's all about it's hard work because racism is there. They're like, yeah, we got this. We understand, you know, white folks treating us this way, blah, blah, blah. We're good to go. OK, now let's get into sexism and then all the denials start to come. And so good practice of like, OK, but we, we just talked about, you know, the different layers between the different isms. You understand these things. But you're, how do we let go of that? And it's exhausting work. Men's work is exhausting, uh, just like a lot of the racial equity work is exhausting. And there are some folks on our team, there's some people who have this, this toolkit expertise that really take on this work and train others to do it. But I, I, I my tendency is to see that at the top where it's dismissed that leadership um, without ever seeing that there's a lot of people who could take it on and have the capacity to do it. Luis, any thoughts? Um. Yeah, I think, uh, well, one thing I've seen also, especially with organizations that are not, not necessarily community-based is when this conversation comes up, it's because there's been an opportunity made to have it. And so uh, that, that conversation is contentious, right? People have been, they've, they've been a lot of weight on the spring for a long time and finally get a chance to, to release some of that. And and I, the reaction, unfortunately, is more like, oh, man, we can't do that again. Look at how look at how wild it got, as opposed to like this is telling us a lot about what's going on under the surface. And so we got to think about all of the places in which, that are creating that right that are creating that reaction. Um, but I did I, I was I was a little bit uh, wanted to speak to what Kianda said about the like, you know, I don't I don't feel like I have to teach people. And I feel like that is um, like, that that's a true thing, right? People, people feel like that. And that's, that's right, right? You shouldn't, we shouldn't be in a world 
or you have to explain yourself or educate people around yourself just so that you get treated fairly, right? That, that should not be. Um, but that is not the world that we are in. And if you're an organizer and you want to carry the badge and feel good and be like, I'm part of the community and people are listening to me, well, that isn't free. You know, part of the cost of being an organizer is the commitment to political education, which means you actually you are the one who has to teach people. And it's also a commitment to personal growth, which means like I am the one who has to think about sexism. You know, just because I'm on the good end of one side doesn't mean I only get to think about those injustices. You know what I mean? Um, so, so that's where, you know, for, for, I think about this oftentimes with my students. So for all the students who want to take up that mantle, like, thank you and you are welcome, but it, it has some additional cost because moving something has additional effort, right? Like overcoming, like change is harder, but change is harder uh, than doing nothing, but it's a lot easier than leaving it, than living with the situation the way it is, I guess. Yeah. Oh, y'all, a week ago, forever. <laughs> Um, I, I I can't thank you enough for your time today. I want to ask you one more question, and um, uh, as we've grappled with this idea of moving into a new normal, and as we grappled with the idea of um, belonging and and belonging as a space and and power and all these different dynamics, um, what to you? is an optimal new normal. For me, an optimal new normal is one that we all belong. It's one in which we all belong. It, it, it always goes back to, I want a tattoo that says belonging, or, you know, we, we need a, a t-shirt or something because that really is an opt that is the optimal society community that I want to live in. I want to be a part of. It is really the one in which we all belong. And that belonging is not uh, relegated to those who agree with me or who agree with the way in which I see the world. It's belonging for everyone. So that's what I would love to see. And, and you know, I don't know that that will happen in my lifetime. I would like to think that the work um, that I do, the work that people like Mac do, the work that people like Dr. Louise do, that you, Esteban, are doing, that Dr. Garcia do, the work, I would like to believe that we are making some inroads in that area and that we're moving in that direction. But the reality is we may not see it in our lifetime, but hopefully we're planting the seeds that at some point there will be a world, there will be a community, a global community and a local community in which belonging belongs to everyone. That's that's what I would really like to see. At the next conference, we'll have a tattoo uh, booth in the back. Yes, we'll have a tattoo. Okay, make sure everything <laughs> is thorough. Make, you know, make sure we're, we're going to be okay. <laughs> Macker, Luis, any thoughts? Uh, I, I'm a little bit tripped up with the thinking about a new normal, and it, it's because of this. It's because, like, you know, before I was in, uh, in medicine, I was talking to a older doctor, and he said, you know, a doctor is someone who walks towards suffering. And I was like, that's it. Like, that's, that's what I want, you know, um, and building the capacity to do that. And so I, what I think about, like, there's always just the human condition, the limitations of the flesh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the finality of death, like all of these things, um, they make it so that there always will be some, some suffering. And so I think what we're trying to do though, is just like, let's, let's deal with the stuff that happens because, because of our bodies, because of, you know, heartache and heartbreak and like, like, like problems that are always going to be there and are real, but we can like let go of all the unnecessary, right? Like we can let go of the like, um, like the the vicious, like the the damage that comes from the viciousness of our society, of our systems. And so, you know, I I guess the new normal is one that's centered around 
protecting people as opposed to figuring out uh, who deserves what, who who needs to be punished and how much, you know, uh, like how do you bar entry um, for each other, right? Like if it's centered around uh, providing for others, you know, I mean, I think that's actually the same way of saying what Kianta said from a different angle, but you know, that's that's what it looks like, right? And and so, you know, that's it. like, I wanna be walking towards the suffering that comes from people's human bodies. It's not like comes from being, you know, from being uh, arrested for, for trying to sleep somewhere. Yeah, Mac? Yeah, you know, for me, I, I just have a lot of belief in like cultural practices and so, um, just to help people out with some of like the language stuff, I'll put it in the chat, but um, so I might need to copy and paste that to everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I don't think I shared it with everyone. Um, like in, in Samoan culture, the, the word that gets loosely translated to respect is alo, which is a play on words of alo mai alo atu, meaning I face you, you face me back. And there's this idea that, uh, or practice of luma mel, like that we are bringing things to the forefront. Um, no, nothing is left behind. And so the presentation of gifts and protocol, these things are done face to face. Conversations in the village are done in a circular house so that representatives of families are bringing forth the words and gifts and meals in front of everybody. But the, the idea that um, we can bring for whatever conversation we need to have and sit down with it. You know, it's also the, a reimagining of like how we're using our time, the, the rush to get everything through without the depth of how much time, um, you know, certain things need. Like this other question around pushing past the 101. A lot of that pushing past the 101 is just doing more than a 101. Uh, and being having a collective agreement that like this is how far we want to push things, but usually it's just to check and check the box. We did that thing and we push forth. There's nothing respectable about that. And so when we bring at least this 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 meaning of I'm bringing to you and you're bringing to me this practice to bring everything forward, we we have a a practice that like you know harmony is what we're facing before we take the next steps. And if we're not in harmony collectively in the in the village setting we're not moving forward and so a lot of this um, practices i'm hoping for you know optimal um happenings in our in our organizing is that uh, whatever you need is is the doors open we don't have doors in Samoa; it's an open house <laughs> but that uh, all these things are are laid out in front of us to to tackle so i, I would love to see more of that practice in both the institution and our organizing Mm. Yeah, there's, um, I knew, I didn't think the conversation would go this way, but there's a way for me to illustrate how I conceptualize every, every way that y'all do this. Give me just a second. And um, I've been thinking about like, how do we consider the world that we find ourselves in? How do we think about um, the different realities and how do we make sense of it? And the only way that I could make sense of it was through a disco ball. And thinking about the different broken pieces, I laugh. Please laugh. This is meant to be funny, but also like serious <laughs> at the same time. Um, a disco ball is full of broken pieces, right? And and this, it, its original intention was to be discarded, but it, but it actually came together to make something really cool, and really meaningful. And it's brought it brings joy, it brings celebration. And I just keep thinking about um, the realities that we experience and how sometimes they leave us broken when reality they can actually make us whole and so i want to thank you uh, each of you for being on this journey with us the last couple of years um, i want to thank you for your time and expertise um, and, and thank you for having honest conversation with us all the time um, it really does mean a lot